Every year at Resus X, we have some debates, and this year is no exception. This year, we're talking about mechanical versus manual CPR. What are the differences? Does it matter? Should you have these mechanical devices in your department? This year, we're bringing in Anand the Swami Swaminathan and Salim the Rebel Res IE to hash this out. I'm really excited for this debate. So, gentlemen, the rules of the debate, they're simple. Each one of you gets seven minutes to state your position. And I'll come in between just to cool the situation down. And then after that, you'll have two minutes each to rebuttal each other. And then we're going to turn it over to the audience and ask them what they think of everything. So if you're ready, I've decided that Anand the Swami, Swaminathan, is going to be going first. Swami, what say you? The truth, Haney, is that I don't need the seven minutes that you've given me. In fact, I'm going to yield a couple of those minutes to Sal because he's going to have to do a lot more mental gymnastics to convince you that mechanical CPR is the way to go. In fact, I'm going to bottom line it up front. There isn't a single shred of high quality evidence that tells us that mechanical CPR is better than what we have already been doing. But let me use a couple of my minutes to get a little bit more into the topic. There's only two things that we know have a benefit in cardiac arrest care, and Salim will not argue these two. It is good, high-quality CPR and early defibrillation. Everything else has fallen by the wayside, medications, hypothermia, all this nonsense. It's one of those two things. And any study, any intervention has to improve one of those two things with the idea of if it improves one of those two things, it improves good neurologic outcomes. There's not a single shred of data that shows that mechanical CPR devices improve good neurologic function. I can stop there, but I have a couple of other points I think are important for us to look at. The data tells us that it doesn't help, but what are the harms of mechanical CPR? Because the data doesn't say that it's worse. If it's not worse, then why not just do it? There are some harms that are there. And I think the biggest one is the application of the device. Putting the device onto the patient is a little bit of an obstacle. And we see it time and time again. I can't tell you how many times I've seen teams fumble in getting this on. And while they're fumbling, the patient's not getting any compressions, which means that's worsening outcomes. It's elongating their no flow or low flow time while we're trying to get this device into place. There are papers out there with injuries from mechanical CPR. I'm not sure that those are all that relevant. If you break a rib because of mechanical CPR, we're probably going to break that rib if I gave you regular CPR too. And if I can't get you back, then I don't really care about these little injuries. The other big thing is cost. And I think the cost here is important for us to note because these devices aren't cheap. They cost somewhere between fifteen dollars and $20,000. That's for a single device. If you're in an EMS system, you can't have one device. You've got to have a couple of them out there. Same thing in a hospital. You can't have one device. You're going to have to have a couple of them. So it's a pretty big investment of capital to buy a couple of these devices at 15 to 20K a pop. But it's not just about the device. You gotta teach everyone how to use them. We just talked about how putting them on, onto a patient is a bit of an obstacle. You gotta teach people how to do this the right way. And the way that it should function is like when you have pit crew at NASCAR. I don't watch a lot of NASCAR. I know Salim loves NASCAR. He loves following those cars around the track. That's how his simple mind works. I understand that. So I'm gonna try and simplify it for him. The pit crew model is what we need. It has to be that smooth going on to the patient, which means you have to train people. And then you have to retrain them, and you got to retrain them. And that's another investment of money. It's an investment of time. And at the heart of this is the logistics and getting it done. If I say, oh, this patient arrested, I need compressions, it's easy enough for someone to jump up and start doing compressions. It's a lot more difficult to get that device into place. And at the cost of 20K a pop, and the fact that it doesn't actually has never been shown to do any better than what we've been doing before, why would I be reaching for it? Ironically, there is a role for these. And I'm not going to say that there's no role. There's a role when you have a very limited crew. If it's you and one nurse in a cardiac arrest, I would love to have one of these mechanical CPR devices. So for these rural critical access hospitals, having a mechanical CPR device is a great idea. But that's exactly where it's unlikely to be because of that prohibitive cost. Same thing with an EMS system that's in the boonies. Great to have one of these because then the patient can get that, those compressions while you're driving 15, 20, 30, 45 an hour to get to the destination. But those are the places that aren't really be able to afford these. And so where do you see them? You see them in academic centers. 
And I work in an academic center. There's always 19 medical students ready to do compressions. And medical students are cheaper than these devices. That's the bottom line. They are cheaper, which means that I have good, high quality labor and high quality CPR. So until we show that these improve benefits, that they're not cost prohibitive, that we can get them on in a nice, fast way and without a huge investment in training, I don't really see any role for this being the standard practice. Yo, Swami is bringing the heat. Sal, you get seven minutes to rebuttal. Let's go. So, Swami, that's great. You made a lot of very good arguments. You definitely look better than I do today. I'll give you all those things. But at the end of the day, I think Swami and I fall in line with the most important things we do are compressions, the quality of the compressions, and then early defibrillation in the patients who have shockable rhythms. These are the two things that have been shown over and over again to improve survival with good neurologic outcome, which at the end of the day is what we care about and what our patients care about. Now, that sounds great in theory, Swami, but let's think about this. When is the last time you ran a code and you were paying attention to the compression rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute? the compression depth of two to two and a half inches, limiting pauses, because there's lots of studies out there that have shown that we can't even get the basics right as humans. And so although medical student labor might be cheaper, I would argue that you're paying for quality and ensuring that you're doing the things that we both agree are the most important things that we do for our patients. And we're not doing it. And for good reason. I'm guilty of this as well. I don't keep up with this stuff. I try to, but there's so much going on during a code that I, I it's, do I keep up with, is it minute three? What round of CPR are we on? Is it time to use the ultrasound? There's so much going on during a code that the one thing that we need to do, the basic thing, we're not doing it. And the evidence bears that out. So the second thing you say about delays, although I agree with you that delays are a bad thing, the way we have gotten around this is just like you would with any procedure. Any procedure that you do, it's not like all of a sudden you get thrown in and say, hey, Swami, go do this central line. Hey, Swami, go do this intubation. There's practice that comes with it, right? There's simulation that we do with it. We practice with these devices. This is no different. And at my shop, the way we get around that delay is we have the back of the Lucas device on the stretcher as we're moving the patient over, that device, the backboard is already on. And so all we gotta do is click the dang thing in. And as far as people not knowing how to use it, it's like an AED. If you've ever seen the top of a Lucas device, it is dummy proof. There are pictures on there for someone like me who watches cars going around in a circle. I, even I know how to use that thing. So if I can do it, then certainly anybody else can do it. The third point I'm gonna make is that there was a really good meta-analysis, and I'm not a big fan of meta-analyses, but when they include good studies in them, I think it's worth bringing up. It was in resuscitation back in, I believe, 2015. And there were five randomized clinical trials with over 10,000 patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and they compared manual to mechanical CPR. And although I agree with your point, there was no difference in ROSC, there was no difference in survival, there was no difference in survival with good neurologic outcome. Although the study didn't show superiority, there was certainly no inferiority either. And so I think we're dealing with two things that are basically bringing us equivalent outcomes. And I, I would be hard pressed to find a difference between the two because the population is just so heterogeneous anyways. The last point I would make, and then I'll turn it over to you, Swami, is that there are plenty of scenarios that I can think in addition to just academic centers using these things and because of the points I've made so far. But if there's limited rescuers available, I work at freestanding ERs. There are EMS agencies out in the boonies and we just simply don't have the man and woman power to keep up with high quality CPR, which we've already both agreed is the most important thing we do for our patients. There are people who have to get transported, long transport times. And there's no way that a two or three person crew is gonna be able to keep up with the quality of the CPR that needs to be sustained. I'll bring up another point. 
ECMO and eCPR is now becoming a big thing at a lot of centers. And I will tell you, being part of that, those codes tend to run longer because it takes time to get the cannulas in people, to make sure that they're, they're in the right spot, to get them on circuit, to get things flowing. Those codes are just going to simply run longer. And you don't want 50 million people around the patient. You want to keep it as streamlined as possible. In the back of a moving ambulance or helicopter, and I'm not saying that we either one of us works in that environment, but staff safety is important. And I don't know, I don't think it's a good idea for someone to get unharnessed in one of these moving vehicles and try and perform those compressions. And then the final thing I'll say is that, and you and I are both big proponents of, this is just simply a cognitive offload. If you've ever been in a room where mechanical CPR is ongoing, it just seems like a calmer room. It allows you to focus on what are the reversible causes that potentially cause this patient's cardiac arrest. So you're ensuring that the quality maintains, but now you're actually using your brain to figure out why the patient coded. So Swami, for me, I tend to disagree with your statement of why would we be using these devices and turn it over to you to explain to me and others why we shouldn't. Swami and Sal make some good points. You get two minutes now, two minutes. Don't go over. I'll cut you off to come back at them. Let's go. All right, let me take my two minutes because I'm going to take my two minutes to tell you why Salim is probably right. I am not a big proponent of technological advances in practice. I, I don't think we need it. I'm still working on like an iPhone 8 over here. I, I still like my direct laryngoscope, but the mechanical CPR devices do help us because exactly what Salim said, they are quiet. The room is quiet. I don't have to worry about the compressor not doing a good job because that machine is going to do a good job, which means that I can think about other things like what else should I be doing? Should I be positioning my ultrasound? Can I get an A line in? Can I get a central line in if I need that? Is there a specific medication I should be thinking about? It, it does cognitively offload me away from having to worry about those quality of compressions. But I will say that there are some caveats to that caveat as well, which is you have to make sure that the device is placed properly. It's not enough that it's just on the bed before you transfer the patient over. Is it actually compressing over the heart? And there are a couple of ways to figure this out. You could just drop a TEE probe, which I don't have. I don't have a TEE probe to, to drop. And my ultrasound people tell me I can't just take a phased array probe and shove it down the person's throat. That doesn't work. That's not how you can do that. But what you can do is look at your end tidal CO2. And if you have a good end tidal CO2 waveform, then you're probably getting good compressions. You can look at an A-line, which I'm putting in in all my cardiac arrests, and that can tell you that you're actually getting good compressions. It's over the heart. So I think that the mechanical CPR device itself is not without flaws. We can use it better. And the other thing that I'll say about the data is that all of the studies that were run on this were in high-functioning departments. So they were doing really good CPR. Is that the gold standard of what everybody else is doing in the community, what everyone else is doing in their shops? I don't know. I mean, think about it. If you did a study where, uh, you know, go 10 years ago, mechanical CPR devices just came out doing a study in my shop saying, hey, we're going to bring in this machine to do your job because it's better than you. I'd be like, what? I can do better compressions. I'll show you how to do the right compressions. So there could be a bias in the way that these studies were put together. So I would say mechanical CPR devices clearly play a role. I wish the price point wasn't so high and I wish we could all have these and I wish we had better data to push us forward with it. Salim, this is your last chance. You get two minutes to come back at Swami. What do you got to say? So I, I agree with Swami. I, I think, as he said, he and I usually fall in line on a lot of things. And I, I think we do with this as well. And I think it's the same pros and the same cons that you could have put either one of us on the other side of the argument. And we would have just been really emphatic about it because that's just the way we are. But this is like pit crew CPR, and it does need to be practiced. It, it, it's like a, like a dance, and it's not just something that you just shove a bunch of people in and then all of a sudden goes well. There needs to be a team lead, and this is one place where I'll advocate for nurse-led codes because that is a huge help when you have somebody else who's focusing on all the other things so that you can focus on reversible causes and maybe even making sure that the CPR is going well. Everyone needs to know their roles. This is not a complicated procedure, but it's one that we mess up all the time. Maybe we talk about nurse-led codes. Maybe there needs to be somebody who's just in charge of 
not the physician, but somebody who's just in charge of the quality of the CPR and just watching that if we're going to be doing manual as opposed to mechanical just to offload the dock. So there is a cheaper way to offload people just to Swami's point. I do think the cognitive offload is something that is not emphasized enough because I think at the end of the day, it's like CPR is a, a means to an end, but we need to be looking for these reversible causes without affecting the things that we know make a difference in patients. And as far as people who will say that, oh, there's harms with these devices, and we already talked about the delays, but don't tell me that you've never felt ribs and sternums breaking under your hands when you're doing CPR. These mechanical devices are doing what they need to do, so people are going to have some broken bones, but hopefully in the end, those will heal, but they'll be neurologically intact. So all this to say that I agree with Swami's points, and I just think this is something that needs to be practiced and something that we need to put more emphasis on in terms of the quality of the CPR we're doing. And if we're not going to invest in making sure that the manual CPR is being done well, then maybe it's worth investing in is 20,000 or 25,000 um, worth a person's life is the way I would leave it. So there you have it. All right, folks, you heard from Swami, you heard from the rebel. What do you all think? Blow up the chat, put in your comments, and we'll come back to this a little later on in the show and see what you have to think. Are you going to be using mechanical CPR for your cardiac arrests or is it going to be manual all the way? I'm curious to hear what you think. So let's generate this discussion. Mm -hmm.